Hey everybody, David Shapiro here with a video. Uh, today's video is Autism 101, a crash course for the newly neurospicy. Uh, in other words, the video that I wish that I had a year ago. So a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, here's my, my creds. Um, I was a gifted kid. Um, I'm a systemizer. Uh, I figured that out by taking the SQR test. Um, I'm HSP, uh, highly sensitive, um, and I have a very high masking score uh, from the CAT-Q test. Um, my special interests are AI, sci-fi, and fantasy. Uh, Mass Effect and Dragon Age are the best games ever. Um, I've written three books on artificial intelligence and started a successful YouTube channel about it. Uh, Jean-Luc Picard is the best, and I watched the recent Dune uh, like 38 times in two months. So that's a little bit about me. That's my autistic creds. Um, let's move on to the video. So first, here is a table of contents so that you know what to expect. Um, and if you want to jump around, feel free. Um, part one, how you got here. Uh, some of the childhood experiences that you may have. Obviously, I can't cover everything because everyone is unique and there's a huge variety. Some of the adult experiences and difficulties you might be facing that, co that could have brought you here as well. Uh, part two is a brief history of autism starting from the early 20th century up to today. Part three is comorbidities and misdiagnosis. Um, basically, the things that you might have been either misdiagnosed with or that you thought that you had, and it turns out it might actually just be autism. Um, it can also be multiple things. Uh, part four is a glossary of new terms for you, such as masking and stimming. And then part five is very short at the end, which is next steps. And I apologize that it's not on the table of contents. I ran out of space. Um, but you should be able to see it in the, uh, in the video chapter. So just be aware there is a part five. Okay, so part one. How did you get here? What paths brought you here? What are some things that, uh, that you might have experienced? So... First, we'll talk about if you're having a bad day right now, it's entirely possible that's why you got here. Then we'll talk about what your childhood might have been like, um, some of the examples. Again, it's not exhaustive because there's so much variety here. I can't cover everything. I can only share my experience and the experiences that I'm familiar with from my friends and that I've read about. Um, there are also probably some clues along the way that you might have missed, but I don't want you to feel bad about it because a lot of this information is new. Um, then we'll talk, finally, we'll talk about difficulties you've probably faced in the past and are possibly facing now, uh, before we move on to part two. So first, if you're having a bad day, um, you, uh, you, a lot of people, especially, uh, folks that realize as adults, usually in their thirties or forties, such as myself, we often figure this out, figure this being that we're autistic because we go through something really bad, like a major failed relationship, social problems, we lose a job, sometimes all of the above all at once. This is unfortunately uh, very common. I don't want to say normal. I probably shouldn't have said normal. It's common for people like us. Um, you might also be really confused, angry, hurt. You might be doubtful and see like what's wrong with me. Um, this is unfortunately also very uh, common for people like us. Now, I want to have a really big caveat. This video is not meant to give critical or life-saving life -saving advice, not medical advice, legal advice, or anything like that. This is just informational. I'll be sharing my experiences, my observations, and stories that I've heard. So if you do, if you are in really bad shape, please find uh, the help that you need. Again, this is just an informational video. Okay, so uh, autistic childhoods vary uh, drastically. Um, it, autism uh, and neurodiversity varies from person to person very widely. And so because of that, there is no one size fits all autistic childhood. So while that might sound like a cop out, what I mean to say is that your unique experience, if you don't see some of the stuff, that's fine because it is different for everyone. And that's part of learning is saying, oh, was this an autistic thing? Um, and I think there's a subreddit, what's it called? Like autism decoded or something um, where it's like people can go ask like, was this an autistic thing? Plus I have, if you have, uh, once you develop some autistic friends, we text each other all the time. Like, is this an autism thing? Um, best conversations ever. All right, so anyways, 
Some of the more common things, and again, I don't want to say what's normal, but here are some common things that uh, present in autism. So one is precocious and or intense interests. So precocious, if you're not familiar with that word, means um, things that are you're, you might be like too young for. Um, so like you might have a precocious interest in politics or economics or um, even uh, sex or whatever. Um, we often kind of paradoxically grow up too fast, but then we don't grow up enough. Um, so your interest may be precocious or very intense, such as uh, you might develop collections of things or uh, intense uh, intellectual curiosities and want to develop expertise um, far before your age. And if this isn't you, that's fine. There are plenty of, of uh, autistic people who don't. Again, I don't want to say what is typical or normal, just some common possibilities. Um, another one is sensitivity, specifically hypersensitivity um, around uh, sensory issues, uh, eating issues, emotional issues, that sort of thing. Um, basically, the world is too intense for us um, and it can be easily overwhelming. Um, another common possibility is hyperlexia. So hyperlexia means a precocious ability to read. Um, some of us end up with very large vocabularies, um, which uh, again can lead to that kind of precociousness. Um, conversely, we can also have verbal delays or social and emotional delays. So it's weird because it can go either way. We can either be uh, super precocious or super delayed in all of these uh, ways. Um, we very frequently have difficulties at school. Um, sometimes we really love certain aspects of school, like maybe the social aspect or the structure or specific classes. But then we also have super like difficult aspects of school. Like once we get to a certain age, school becomes really difficult or the social problems become um, unmanageable. Uh, so they, these are also very common experiences. Um, uh, for autistic people uh, as they grow up. Um, usually teenhood is really hard. Uh, like it, being a teenager is hard for everyone, but uh, especially from my own experience and watching other YouTubers, um, it seems like adolescence can be particularly hard for us autistic people. Um, there's numerous reasons. I won't go into uh, go, try and unpack it in this video. It, that, take, that would take many, many videos to fully unpack. Um, and then the worst is uh, we often uh, are victims of neglect, abuse, uh, abandonment, or various kinds of trauma, which we'll talk a bit, uh, about a little bit more later in the video. Um, but the short version is because we have special needs, if those needs aren't met, um, it can be we can have very traumatic childhoods. Even with, uh, it, like say for instance, if we had neurotypical or low needs siblings, who grew up fine, um, that child, that same childhood experience might have still been traumatic for us. Um, there's a, a researcher, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, um, but he wrote a, a paper or a book called um, The Orchid and the Dandelion. And so he wrote about how some children are just far more sensitive than others and experiences that would not be traumatic to some children are traumatic to others. And this is a really critical thing for us to understand. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm, uh, spending more time on this is because we are special needs and we have different needs. If those needs aren't met, our childhood very well could have been traumatic, even if it um, at, at, at first glance looks like it was an okay childhood. So just keep that in mind. Um, so what I will say is if you're at this point, as you're learning, you will probably realize that there were clues along the way. Um, my fiance and I have this like running joke where it's like, how did it take us this long to figure out that we are uh, not neurotypical? Um, and the I don't want anyone to feel bad about this because a lot of this information is brand new, and we'll get to that in a later slide. Um, but some of the clues that you might have had along the way were maybe test scores. You might have tested really good or really bad. Um, for me, it was kind of paradoxical. Uh, I was in like, I was regularly in the 99th percentile of all tests until it came to um, reading comprehension. But the reason that I got bad scores on the essay tests was because I was unpacking it too much. 
and I didn't know how to fully form my arguments. And so people are like, what the heck is Dave writing about? This doesn't make any sense. And it's because my understanding was too nuanced and too complex, and I couldn't fully communicate it. Fortunately, I did have an English teacher who told me one day, she was like, we we're talking about, um, oh, what was it? It was one of the one of the books that we read. I think it was the Canterbury Tales. And I was unpacking like the nuances of the morality. And she's like, Dave, you are talking over the heads of everyone in this class. I know what you're, <laughs> what you're saying, but you are too advanced, so shut up. She didn't say it quite like that. But the point being is that um, we can test really good or really bad. Again, it's kind of this paradoxical like, uh, spectrum. Um, we might have really odd friend groups. We might be friends with the pariahs or the rejects, or we might not have any friends, or we might be friends with the, the nerds, uh, the chess club, the computer club, that sort of thing. Um, so that can, that can be a clue. And again, some of this is normal stuff. Just because you had these things doesn't necessarily automatically mean that you are autistic because there's plenty of neurotypicals who test well and are members of social groups, right? Um, but when, so what you're looking for is a pattern uh, and we'll get into patterns later. Uh, so another thing is uh, stimming and other behaviors. Um, so like I was really annoying as a teenager. I was loud. I, um, I made obnoxious noises. Um, and it turns out like, oh, I was just autistic because I didn't understand what was socially appropriate. Um, so those kinds of things, uh, might've been clues. I learned to stop doing those because, uh, actually I remember it was one very specific incident where I like made an obnoxious noise and my cousin and my uncle were like, Dave, knock it off. Like stop doing that forever. And I was like, okay, I'll stop. Um, but like that was a behavior that I should have grown out of as a teenager, but I hadn't. Um, another thing that, uh, could be a clue is if you've had meltdowns, shutdowns, or periods of reclusivity. Um, and we'll go over those in greater detail later. Um, uh, if you have depression and anxiety and other things, that can also be a clue that maybe you haven't fit in and that you've maybe not, not had your needs met. Um, and then there also might be, uh, you might have, uh, I don't want to say disorders, but you might have struggles or issues around relationships and or sex, uh, and other forms of intimacy. I should have said uh, relationships and intimacy, not just sex. Um, and I won't go too much into detail on that because that's a whole other can of worms. That might be another video in the future. So if you had any of these things and more, again, like I said, I can't create an exhaustive list. This is just like some of the common themes. These might have been clues that you had growing up. And if you didn't connect the dots until now, don't feel bad about it. I didn't until I was 36. Um, <laughs> had to remember. Um, and it is actually really common for, uh, for those of us to kind of come to the game late in life, so to speak. Um, now, that being said, so we talked about childhood and developmental difficulties or problems that we may have had. So let's talk about adult difficulties that you may have had or be having. So one is work difficulties, uh, whether it's job loss or frequent job change, um, if you can't handle the daily grind and it feels soul crushing, obviously everyone jokes about how, you know, like the nine to five is kind of tedious, but for some of us, it's actually not sustainable. Um, and then if you are constantly distant from your coworkers, like that can be another clue. Um, put it this way. Uh, I usually got invited to the bar with my coworkers once. Um, I got invited to lunch with my coworkers once and then they realized like, wow, Dave's weird. Um, but also I, I never really connected with my coworkers. Um, so that could be something that you've experienced where like, I honestly just preferred to be by myself to eat, eat on my own. And so the pandemic and working from home stellar for my career. Um, and then I quit anyways, I'll talk about that later. Um, relationship difficulties. So if you are perpetually alone, um, it's entirely possible that neurodiversity is part of the reason for that. Um, if conversely, you have many toxic or disastrous relationships, autism could also be part of that. Uh, and again, so it's like this, this spectrum of opposites. Um, that being said, there are plenty of autistic people who do have good relationships, but many of us have had some doozies. <laughs> we'll talk about that more later. Um, and then social difficulties such as loneliness, never fitting in, never finding your tribe, um, bullying and rejection, and just honestly feeling like an alien. 
I remember many years ago, I read um, a book about Nikola Tesla that um, took uh, excerpts from his diaries. And the dude honestly thought he was an alien because he realized that his perception of the world was so vastly different from the people around him. He's like, maybe I'm not actually human. Um, and that really resonated with me. Okay, so let's talk about the two, two of the likely scenarios, not the only scenarios, but two of the likely scenarios that brought you here today. Why are you watching this video? So the first is the path of suck. Um, maybe you had a relationship implode. Maybe you had a job implode. Uh, something bad happened. Maybe you're really burned out. That's how I figured out um, that I was autistic. It was I was just in the state of perpetual burnout. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? I had enough and I wanted answers. And I finally just like, I cast the widest net. I talked to my friends. I actually had, I have a friend who worked with autistic children. And so I was like, I was having difficulties and I texted, texted her and I was like, am I autistic? Like, like she would know. And she had dropped hints. Like, so here's an ethical thing. Like if you know that someone is autistic, you can't just tell them until they're ready. You have to wait for them to ask. So she's like, you might be, <laughs> go take this test. <laughs> so she was very helpful and very supportive. Um, and that was, that started me on this path of learning. Now you might also be here just because you're curious. You might not be in a state of distress, which if, if that's true, good. I like, I'm actually really happy for you that you found this information before it became bad. Um, maybe you've taken some online tests. Maybe someone suggested it to you. Maybe you realize that your friends are autistic or that your friends are weird. And you're like, Hey, maybe we're on the spectrum. Uh, maybe a TV character resonated with you. Uh, the most recent one was Wednesday Adams, um, from the Netflix version. Um, she is very heavily typed as, uh, as, uh, neuro spicy. Um, the line where she said, uh, like, stop confusing me with your emotional Morse code or something like that. <laughs> the, the Aspie memes subreddit really liked that one. Um, so, but basically, you know, you might be doing okay, but you want answers. So if, if either of these paths or another path brought you here, just wanted to show that if, if this resonates, you're probably in the right place. Okay, so now part two, let's do a very brief history of autism. The reason that I wanna share this with you is because the context is actually really, really helpful. A lot of this information comes from the book Neurotribes um, and other books, which we'll talk about. I'll give you some resources towards the end of the video. Um, but let's go over the history so that you understand that like this is all brand new stuff. So first there is Hans Asperger, uh, who was a pediatrician in Vienna. Um, and in 1946, he wrote a seminal paper about autistic psychopathy or autistic psychopathy, uh, which is not a very nice name, um, but he was doing the best that he could. Yes, he worked with the Nazis and that is very controversial. Uh, so basically take everything from Asperger's with a grain of salt, um, but he did set the stage and he started the conversation. Um, he started defining what this is. Now, um, one of the most enduring problems was that his original research fo focused only on boys. And so because of that, until very, very recently, um, boys have been uh, diagnosed with autism disproportionately to girls. And we are still dispelling myths about the fact that autism can present very differently in girls and women and, and, and uh, assigned female at birth. One of the key differences, uh, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say this as a, as a blanket statement, but one of the most common differences is that autistic girls tend to be quieter, um, and so they're like they basically type as like, oh, you're just a sweet, shy, quiet girl, and that's fine. And so autistic girls are far more likely to be missed. Um, that is the, again, that is like a vast oversimplification. There's plenty of other aspects, but I'm not an autistic girl. There's plenty of autistic uh, women YouTubers out there who will help you if you are uh, in that category and need more help. Um, Purple, Purple Ella and um, Mom on the Spectrum are two of my favorite uh, autistic women YouTubers. Um, so fast forward into the 50s and 60s, the development of ABA or Applied Behavioral Analysis um, is, uh, let's just say super problematic. It focused on correcting the quote, bad behavior of autism, um, forcibly through punishment 
or what they uh, euphemistically called operant conditioning. Um, so basically, if, if there was a behavior that, that your parents or family didn't like, then you would be pretty much coerced into stopping those behaviors, whether it was echolalia, which is, um, which is uh, verbally repeating things, um, or stimming, or whatever else. And so this is super problematic because it prioritizes the needs and experience of parents rather than the uh, rather than the needs and rea and emotions of the victim. And I do say victim very deliberately. Uh, many people who have gone through ABA consider themselves victims and say that it was a very traumatic experience. Um, so, like, yeah, it's bad. I, fortunately, I I had never even heard of it until. Um, more recently as I was doing research. Uh, but yeah, like I have friends that are, that are more uh, autistic or, or my friend that has worked with autistic children and she's like, ABA is pure evil. Um, basically, one of the things that it does is that it conditions uh, victims to accept arbitrary punishment from strangers um, and to also suppress their individual needs, which makes them uh, extremely vulnerable to abuse uh, uh, and other aspects in life and later in life. Um, it is widely considered unethical, ineffective, and problematic by many groups of people, and yet it is still practiced and continues to this day. That being said, there have been some strides to make it more humane, but in general, uh, the consensus uh, is that ABA needs to go away. There are some people that have gone through ABA that say it was fine, um, but I think that they are in the minority. Um, so fast forwarding, through the uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, that was kind of like a, 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 a winter, a, a dark age of, of autism, where it was kind of like it was only boys and only the most extreme cases were recognized. Um, fast forward to the, to the 90s and early 2000s, and that's when the current um, ASD renaissance started happening. So... One of the one of the, the, the uh, one of the seminal um, moments, one of the hallmark moments, was a conference was held in Los Angeles in 2010 to go over autism. It was basically to workshop like what is what is this really? And actually, this this screenshot comes from a video where they were talking about this conference. I don't know if if the video was taken at the conference or if it was after the conference. I think this video comes from 2014, where it was kind of like a post mortem of this conference. So uh, that conference led to the DSM-4 criteria being revised in 2011, and finally it was fully integrated into the DSM-5 in 2013. So this is only 10 years ago that the current criteria were even established. And one thing to keep in mind is that it takes, on average, seven years for new medical standards to be fully disseminated. Um, and that's on average. There's obviously a lingering uh, thing. So this is information that is still kind of being circulated. And even in this video, which um, I've got it, I've got it here, um, revised DSM-5 di diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder. I definitely, if, if you're interested in learning about the history, I definitely recommend that you watch this video like pretty much in its entirety. Um, this speaker does a really good job of explaining how the diagnostic criteria was reassessed and also the fact that there are still some enormous gaps in it. So keep in mind that even as of 2013, the DSM-5, even the experts say this is entirely inadequate for what autism is. So even the experts know that the current definition is bad, but it's better than it was. So progress has been made, but it's still pretty yikes. So our contemporary understanding um, is, uh, I just wanted to give a much more recent timeline so in 2015, Autism from the Inside channel was started. Um, in 2016, the Purple Ella channel was started. In 2016, Neuro Tribes, the book that I mentioned earlier, was published. Um, in 2018, Embrace Autism website was founded. Uh, in 2020, The Pattern Seekers was published, which The Pattern Seekers, it was a good book, but it focuses on like the autistic superpower people. Um, like Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison and, and people like me who are really strong in like science and technology and completely ignores uh, women. Um, so just keep in mind that the Pattern Seekers is problematic, but it still has some helpful information. Um, in 2021, Mom on the Spectrum channel was started, who, that's, this is her. 
I adore her. She is a trip. I love listening to her explain things. Um, and then finally in 2022, Unmasking Autism by Devin Price was published. And I think that this book, Unmasking Autism, is probably going to be uh, considered the like the herald of like the new era of understanding uh, autism. And certainly all of these YouTubers have also contributed. So I, I want to really drive home the point that a lot of this information is brand new and it takes time for this information to be disseminated and understood and discussed. So this is how we got, this is, this is the full history of how we got to where we are today of autism. And you notice I've got my little stimming cube <laughs> so that I don't like rock and stuff. Okay. So part three, comorbidities and misdiagnoses. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, autism is often mistaked, mistaken as uh, uh, mistaken. Um, there are also some legitimate comorbidities. Now, all that being said, I have to put a huge asterisk on all this. I cannot give you medical diagnosis. I cannot, um, I cannot give you medical advice. All I'm doing is presenting generalities from the web. Um, so these are observations from Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, and, um, and also my friends. Uh, so again, take all of this with a grain of salt uh, and keep in mind that these are just my personal opinions, not medical advice, not diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so number one, uh, something that is very common is executive dysfunction. So executive dysfunction is often called ADD or ADHD. There are other kinds of executive executive dysfunction, but those are ADHD and ADD are the most common, commonly understood models. Um, there's three primary uh, symptoms of executive dysfunction. So one is impulse control, which is doing things that maybe you shouldn't have. Um, another is some kind of a, attention disorder, whether it's lack of attention or hyperfocus. Again, it, you have this like polarity. And then there's hyperactivity, um, such as uh, um, manic episodes, or uh, hyperfocus, or being super loud, super energetic, or um, states of high arousal, uh, that sort of thing. So some common problems, um, if you do have executive dysfunction, not everyone does. Um, and, and in fact, this is one of the things that I, I don't have that much anymore. I think that I probably could have qualified as ADHD one day, but I've learned to cope and compensate. And I also uh, sleep diet and other changes really help with this stuff. Um, but anyway, some common problems that you might have if you do have executive dysfunction is difficulty reading or other um, long focus tasks, anything that comes across as boring, right? If you cannot tolerate boredom or uh, hypo arousal. So the, 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 the clinical term for this is hypo arousal, which means under aroused. If anything is not stimulating enough, you can't do it. That is a common uh, symptom of executive dysfunction. Now, that being said, all of us have a certain level of arousal that is required for us to get by. And that's what stimulant drugs like Adderall do, is they actually make you feel more stimulated doing really boring things. Um, so they give you an artificial dose of, of the neuro, neurotransmitters that happen when you are sufficiently stimulated. So there's hypoarousal, which means you're under aroused, and there's hyperarousal, which means you're overstimulated. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we talk about meltdowns. Um, another common problem with, uh, with executive dysfunction is, is most commonly interrupting people um, or other kinds of uh, social problems like uh, inappropriate behavior or inappropriate outbursts or topics of conversation that people find unacceptable. We'll talk about that more later because usually once we get together, like we are completely uncensored and it's great. Like, you know, I can text uh, my autistic friends and be like, so let's talk about masturbation. And they're like, okay, cool, let's talk about it. Um, and if you have the right group of friends, like there are no taboo topics and it's great. Um, uh, another, one of the last common problems around executive dysfunction is that daily chores can be really bad. And that goes back to that hypo arousal problem where doing dishes and laundry and cooking for yourself or even just checking email or whatever. For me, it's, it's any mail, doing taxes, like car stuff. Oh my God, I hate that stuff because it's so boring. Anyways, so yeah, maybe I do have some more ADHD. Um, now, some common strengths of executive dysfunction is hyperfocus. And I say that this is a strength because if you learn to use it, 
if you learn to turn it off and turn it on and learn what gets you hyper-focused and how to get out of it, um, it can be a freaking superpower. Um, Devin Price talks about this in his book where because we often can work far faster than most people, with one or two hours of work, we get as much work done as many other people get in a day or two done. Um, so hyper-focus can be super valuable if you use it tactfully and you also can get out of it. Um, I have gone into hyper-focus for the longest stretch was I think 11 hours straight while I was revising a book. I don't recommend doing that. I was in bad shape after that. Now I limit myself to like two hours maximum. Um, we can also have intense and broad interests, which means that we can be very well read and also very colorful and interesting people. Some of the weirdest, coolest people that you meet are going to be those with ADHD and or other forms of neurodiversity. Um, depending on the study you look at, there is a comorbidity of 30 to 50 percent between autism and, um, and executive dysfunction such as ADHD. I don't really care about those studies because the methodology, this, that, and the other, like you have executive dysfunction or you don't, we don't need to talk about diagnostics here. Okay. So a little bit less fun is attachment disorder. So attachment disorders can be very common with autism for a number of reasons. So one is childhood mistreatment, such as abuse or neglect. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you might have had what would be a, a more than sufficient, a good enough upbringing for a, for a neurotypical child, but it might not have met your needs. And if your needs are chronically unmet, that counts as neglect, which is a form of abuse, which can result in anxious or insecure attachment. Um, and it, again, it comes down to the fact that you just did not get your emotional needs met. And so you might have emotional development differences. This can also lead to uh, it, it can, it can, it, this is kind of a chicken or the egg problem. It can cause and also lead to social difficulty. So it can be kind of a vicious cycle. Um, but basically what, what this amounts to is we end up in harmful, toxic and codependent relationships. Um, we, we, and I say we meaning neurodivergent or neurodiverse people, we tend to be uh, more vulnerable than average. Um, and it's not that we're like, especially gullible or anything, but it's a combination of we don't have healthy relationship schemas. We don't know what genuine attachment really feels like. And so because of that, we don't have a good model with which to approach relationships. And so that makes us either vulnerable to people who deliberately uh, prey on such people, which is actually really rare. What happens more often is that um, we just organically end up in relationships that are, that are uh, toxic. Um, and that's not to excuse anyone, um, you know, because unfortunately, like we have to take, we have to learn to take care of ourselves. Um, they said on the channel, um, uh, 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 cinema therapy, they, uh, the, the mantra was, uh, your mental health issues are not your fault, but they are your responsibility. And that sucks. And autism is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And that sucks. Right. And so part of learning to deal with autism is learning about attachment disorder and working on it. Um, I actually have a book that I recommend. It's called Insecure in Love, which is written from a neurotypical perspective. But it's a very helpful book if you want to learn about attachment schemas uh, or relationship schemas and attachment disorders. Um, so one thing that is interesting is that some of our relationships are actually really great and some of them are awful. And until you realize that autism is and vulnerability uh, and disorder are like some of the ingredients, it might confuse you as to like why some relationships are great and some are awful. Um, like I'm still friends with a lot of my uh, ex-girlfriends and I am absolutely not friends with some of them. And I was like, what's the pattern here? And the pattern was the ones that I'm still friends with are, uh, are narrow spicy. And uh, the ones that I am not are disordered in other ways. Um, so that's that. Uh, personality disorders. So personality and mood disorders are often uh, misattributed uh, or, or rather autism is often misdiagnosed as a personality disorder. Um, and that is, again, because we are learning to recognize uh, autism a little bit better. But also the trauma that I talked about can result in symptoms that look like personality disorders. So when we talk about meltdowns and shutdowns and attachment disorder, these are all very commonly associated with personality disorders, 
And you know, you might say, okay, well, autism is part of your personality, therefore it's a personality disorder. But I think it's actually really important to separate it out because the genesis of these things can be very different. Whereas autism is largely um, environmental and genetic. I think it's 70% genetic, I'm not sure. Um, whereas personality disorders are often caused, um, uh, are often almost exclusively, uh, uh, ge uh, not genetic, environmental, um, family uh, abuse and trauma and, and things like that. There are, there are very few cases of like primary psychopathy and primary sociopathy, which is someone is just genetically disordered. Um, but personality disorders are very commonly created by deeply, deeply dysfunctional families. Not always, but often. Um, so, but I still want to talk about um, the, the, the three cluster B personality disorders so that you understand like, oh, if I associate with that or if someone accused me of that, maybe it was a misattribution and you're actually autistic. So histrionic personality disorder is primarily about people who, uh, is primarily about um, being the center of attention or attention seeking behavior such as acting out in public or seeking sex and relationships. Um, one of the aspects of histrionic uh, disorder is highly capricious or mercurial, mercurial emotions, such as emotions that are really intense and often inappropriate given the situation. Borderline personality disorder is about instability. Um, it's about unstable uh, emotions, unstable sense of self, um, and it is one of the biggest hallmarks is really intense and tumultuous relationships. Now, again, I just talked about uh, attachment disorder and the fact that we often end up in catastrophic relationships, which might make you think that you could be borderline, but it might also just be that you're a victim of a borderline or someone else uh, with some other kind of disorder. Uh, another aspect of borderline personality disorder is that it is associated with impulsive and self-destructive behavior. Um, I remember a while ago I read that 10% uh, that of all borderline lives end in suicide, um, which is like, that's pretty crazy. Uh, that is a very, very high uh, representation. And then finally, narcissistic personality disorder or narcissism is uh, about uh, grandiosity, um, which is paradoxically paired with vulnerability. So there's what's called, the, there's the grandiose narcissist, but the, there's also the vulnerable narcissist. Um, and this can manifest as a need for admiration, which is basically another form of insecurity is like, hey, I don't feel good about myself, please reassure me. And then uh, uh, fragility, emotional fragility, um, arrogance, and a lack of empathy uh, are also aspects of that. Now, the lack of empathy thing is interesting because as autistic people, we might not connect with, with people or we might have a flat affect. We might have things that from the outside appear to be lack of empathy or impulsivity or disordered relationships, but it's actually just all autism. So again, I want to really have a big asterisk is I don't want to say like if you if you do have a personality disorder, like there is help that you can get. And I don't want to I don't want to like say like just throw a blanket over it like, oh, you're actually just autistic. I'm not telling you that. But what I am saying is that autism is often uh, misattributed to these dis these disorders. And I don't know what the comorbidity is. Um, so in some circles, they're called fleas which is like you might have some traits of disorders, um, but you might not have the disorder itself. And that's called a flea, which is like if you lie with dogs, you get fleas. And so it's like, OK, you might have had some bad stuff brush off on you from a toxic family or a toxic relationship. So just wanted to throw that out there. It's really complicated. Um, and then finally, one of the common threads for all of this is trauma, anxiety and depression. So chronic and or severe maltreatment is trauma. That's what trauma is. So this includes emotional neglect, coercion, abuse, gaslighting, manipulation, and control, and a litany of other uh, kinds of mistreatment. Um, trauma is often at the heart of anxiety and depression, um, which can also result in ADHD, attachment disorder, and personality disorder. Um, trauma can happen at any time. Uh, it's often different, like uh, what is traumatic to a child is often different to what's traumatic as a, to an adult. It can happen at work. It can happen at home, school, pretty much anywhere. And uh, 
th th this topic is entirely too complex to fully unpack because uh, it has to do with um, with the way that your brain is wired and the way that it rewires. I recently learned that chronic stress actually increases the size and sensitivity of the amygdala. And I'm not gonna go too deep into neuroscience, but basically the amygdala is what mediates um, anxiety and fear and a few other things. Um, but it, imagine that you, know, you have chronic stress due to being autistic and not getting the support that you need. So you end up with a hypersensitive amygdala, which keeps you upregulated and hypervigilant at all times. It's pretty awful. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point out, and, and one thing that I forgot to put on this slide is that uh, trauma often has a vicious cycle with autism because trauma can make the symptoms of autism worse, uh, which and can then provoke more trauma. So for instance, if you had a difficult childhood, you already have enough struggles, which can cause you to struggle at work, which can cause you to get into a toxic relationship, and those can create even more trauma as an adult, which makes everything even worse, which is why at the beginning of the video, I said that people often find their way to this in their 30s or 40s is because this vicious cycle has continued for too long and enough is enough. That's not always the case, but it is, it is uh, often enough the case that it's worth mentioning. All right, part four, glossary of key terms. So if you're new to autism, if this, is an, if this is a new idea to you, there's a whole litany of terms that you're probably going to find and that you um, might, might wanna know about. So first is masking. So autistic masking is, uh, or it's also sometimes called camouflaging. Uh, and this is the uh, cat Q test that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can take that on Embrace Autism. Um, so masking is, uh, it's a broad category. There's three subcategories. So first is masking, which is hiding or suppressing any traits, any autistic traits, so that you can appear to be more neurotypical, such as stimming, verbal tics, and special interests. There's obviously plenty of other autistic traits that you might hide, uh, facial expressions, so on and so forth. Um, so masking is just hiding it. Um, the second is compensation, which is practicing social skills to make up for cognitive, emotional, or social differences. I don't wanna say deficits. We'll talk about the disability model in a minute, um, but for now we're just focusing on, on, on compensation for differences. So this might be a matter of developing rules or templates or acting skills. So, um, I actually had a story that I wanted to share about compensation. When I finally quit my day job, on my last day, I had a I had a chat with my boss, and um, you know he was he was very sad. He wanted me to stay, and uh, one thing I told him I was like I am very different, and he said No, you're not. And I said That's because I've been acting. And he didn't know how to process that, and he just he kind of he let it go. He he understood what I meant, and I was like I am not who you think I am. I have been pretending to be normal this entire time for the last three years. Um, and uh, I was like, and I'm done, I'm done pretending. I'm gonna be true to myself from now on. Um, and the third category of masking is what's called assimilation, which is more like making strategic decisions about uh, where you live um, and, and where you work and how you live, how you work, your friend groups and other coping strategies. So assimilation is more like planning Compensation is more like practice and masking is more like hiding. Um, so these are things that you'll wanna know. Um, I mentioned the book Unmasking Autism by Devin Price. Cardinal work on this. Meltdowns. Um, so meltdowns are, well, as defined, a meltdown is an intense and overwhelming emotional and behavioral response to a stressful or triggering situation, typically characterized by angry outbursts, crying and or physical agitation. So a meltdown is often labeled categorically as quote, inappropriate behavior. Um, so this is why things like ABA have come up. And this is also uh, one reason for bullying and rejection um, in, in neurotypical society is people can just say, oh, you're aggressive. Oh, that's inappropriate behavior. And they just use that as a, as a justification to bully you, which then makes it worse. Um, it's, sometime, uh, uh, it's also sometimes referred to as regressive behavior. And so basically that's why I had a picture of a child is because meltdowns can sometimes look like a temper tantrum 
Um, but it's basically like you're overwhelmed. So I talked earlier about the term hyper arousal. So hypo arousal is when you're bored to tears. Hyper arousal is when you're overstimulated for uh, too long um, and then you enter into a state of distress or dysregulation. Um, and so it can, be, it can be caused by any number of any kind of distress, whether it's loud noises or misophonia, which is uh, an inability to tolerate certain kinds of sounds, um, regardless of volume. Uh, it can be caused by temperature. Um, if you're too hot or too cold for me, I can't tolerate. Well, it's weird. I can tolerate high heat if I'm outside and walking, but if I'm inside and I need to be relaxing, like temperature, like I can't handle high temperature. Um, restrictive clothing or uncomfortable clothing that has a bad texture, um, that can cause distress. Uh, crowds, parties, those kinds of things can also cause distress. Then there's internal sensations. If you become of your heartbeat um, or digestion or reflux or whatever, nausea, internal sensations can also cause distress, which can lead to a meltdown. And there's overwhelm of any kind. Um, there's lots and lots of other videos. Some of the YouTubers that I mentioned earlier, they have a lot of videos about meltdowns and how to cope with them. Again, that is a huge topic. Um, the triggers vary. And there's also, um, there's also the concept of the window of tolerance. So the window of tolerance is how big is the window between hypo arousal and hyper arousal. And for some people, your window is very narrow. So for some people, your window is narrow at all times where you have a very narrow band of comfort. Now, there are things that can change your window of tolerance, such as quality of sleep that you've had, if you've eaten well enough, or if you've had too much coffee, or if you've eaten junk food, or you're under a lot of stress lately, um, or you're feeling lonely. Those are all things that can change your window of tolerance. And so there are some times that like, oh, wow, like I wouldn't have been able to tolerate that. I would have had a meltdown before. Um, and, and other times it's like, you know, you might be on a hair trigger. Fortunately, um, for myself, I can say I have not had a meltdown in like many years. Um, and that is because I've learned to take better care of myself. Physical health, such as getting adequate exercise, sleep, uh, and diet, are for me have been absolutely critical in widening the window of tolerance. Um, so that is one thing. Shutdowns. A shutdown is kind of the opposite of a meltdown. So a meltdown is like an explosive response. A shutdown is an implosion, uh, implosion response, where basically instead of instead of becoming more energetic, you become less energetic, um, and so you enter into a state of excessive fatigue, um, which is often associated with cognitive impairment, such as memory la lapses, loss of vocabulary. This is one of the weirdest things. Um, and if you've watched my videos on my other channel, you'll notice that sometimes it's like I can't remember a word. There's a few words that I can't recall right now. Um, so this is all, these, these are all under the category of loss of function. So you might lose the ability to plan, to think ahead, to do anything other than just like become a reptile and go to sleep, <laughs> right? There's other kinds of uh, responses during shutdown, such as mutism, um, not, or, or otherwise nonverbal periods or other verbal difficulties where you can't express yourself. You might also lose prosody. So prosody is the ability to change your tone and inflection to convey emotion, but sometimes you will speak very, very flatly if you, um, if you are experiencing a shutdown. And that is, and some, some autistic people speak um, without prosody at all times. It's not always true. That's one of the myths that, that, uh, that needs to be dispelled is that just because you're autistic doesn't mean that you have a robotic affect. Um, anyways, that's a whole other topic. Um, and then finally, you know, withdrawal and collapse uh, is kind of the quintessential shutdown. It's where it's like, okay, I need to go be by myself for like a week. Um, that is a quintessential shutdown. Uh, stimming. So stimming is a term that you'll probably hear, which uh, is a much more friendly term than the clinical self-stimulating behavior. Everyone stims. It's just a matter of how, when, and why. So... A better way of looking at stimming is it's doing something because it's soothing and feels good. Um, so fidgeting, flapping, rocking, that sort of stuff. Um, you might notice that sometimes I like, you know, uh, rock in the chair. I also have my, my cubes so that I can be doing something with my hands. Um, if you watch my other videos, sometimes maybe you don't see it because my hands are down here, but I'll, I'll sometimes rub my knuckles as I'm talking. And again, that's just, it's creating 
uh, a sensation that is pleasant and soothing. Um, other times, rolling around on the floor um, can feel really good. Uh, there is a um, uh, there's actually some therapies uh, uh, around that. I can, again, I can't remember what it's called right now. Um, I'll tell you later if I remember. Um, but rolling, flapping, um, touching and petting yourself. So again, like you know, rubbing my knuckles. Um, I also will sometimes you'll see me like kind of like pet my head. It looks like a thinking thing, but it's actually a stimming behavior. It's like, ooh, that kind of feels good. Um, actually, that does feel really good right now. Sorry. Um, it can feel compulsive. So here's why, here's one of the reasons why um, ABA is so bad is because ABA explicitly and deliberately punishes stimming because it is a quote aberrant behavior for no reason. There's nothing medically wrong with stimming. It's just that it is considered socially unacceptable. Um, and so ABA wants to stamp out stimming sometimes like with like semi like somewhat violent punishments. Um, and the thing is, is with a compulsion, if you don't do it, it gets worse, right? Like I can force myself to sit here and not fidget, but I'm, I will then be expending additional cognitive energy fighting that compulsion where I could just do the stimming behavior and then I don't have to think about it. Right. Um, and uh, I did forget to mention in the uh, comorbidities about OCD. So many people that are autistic uh, first think that they're HSP and OCD and a litany of other things. And, uh, and my friend is like, yeah, that's basically all just autism. Um, <laughs> uh, again, it, it can be dangerous to throw categorical blankets over things, but holy mackerel, like once you understand autism, it's like that does explain a lot. Um, stimming is often seen as socially unacceptable, which is problematic. Uh, so for instance, like if you feel really tight, sometimes I'll stretch in public. And I know that like some people are like, what are you doing? Like stretching feels good, bro. Like just do it. <laughs> like it doesn't hurt anybody. Um, and then co-stimming is exceptionally weird. So co-stimming is if you have a friend or a partner that um, that like you kind of interact with each other. Um, and that is like, that's really weird to do in public, but it's also really fun. Like my fiance and I will be like, hanging out and then like I'll just be like petting her arm and she's like are you stimming with my arm and I'm like oh yeah I am <laughs> sorry <laughs> um, anyways so stimming is a thing uh, sensory processing issues so there's sensory stuff uh, whether it is misophonia I mentioned that earlier taste and texture aversions so many autistic children are very picky eaters and that is because most things just feel gross to them um, you know, I've seen ch children that if they eat something that is, has the wrong texture, they'll throw up. Um, and it's, it, and it has to do with, um, uh, I think that it has to do with, uh, like maybe synesthesia where like a physical sensation triggers another sensation that is not directly appropriate. Um, like tinnitus, uh, it, it, it which is something that I have, uh, I consider tinnitus to be another kind of sensory processing issue. Tinnitus in my case is because there's neural signals leaking from other parts of my brain into the audio auditory processing complex or whatever. Um, and so a little bit more about the, the neurology, the neuroscience of autism is that sometimes uh, depending, depending on the genetic profile, you might have more or fewer distal connections in the brain than a neurotypical person does. I think I'm on the side that I have more distal connections which gives me like stronger sense of intuition, but it can also create sensory processing issues because sometimes signals end up in places that they're not supposed to be. Um, but then, the, then uh, another kind of autism where you know people kind of can't connect the dots, um, that is where I, I suspect, again, I can't, uh, this is just my pet theory, but I suspect that that is when there is an insufficient number of distal connections in the brain, meaning that you can't quite connect the dots. Um, but anyways, point being sensory processing issues of all kinds, regardless of what the neurogenesis of it is, that's a, that's a thing. Um, claustrophobia and restrictive and, and the inability to tolerate restrictive clothing or clothing with bad textures. Um, you might notice that I wear this sweater all the time because it is very comfortable and very loose and inoffensive. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite articles of clothing. Um, digestive issues. So one of the things that has become obvious lately is that there is a strong link 
between the gut and the brain. So it's called the gut-brain axis. Um, the, micro, the, the microbiome of the gut has a very strong impact of the brain. And this seems like it is pronounced um, in autism. It could also be causative. So what I'll say for myself is when I improved my diet and I started taking probiotics, my brain cleared up a lot. So there's probably some inflammation signals that go back and forth. Not really sure. There's a lot of research out there. There's not really a conclusive thing like, oh, if you have autism, you need lactobacillus, et cetera, et cetera. For me, it helped. No promises if it'll help you. Um, you might also uh, have trouble with touch and hugging. Um, and, or you might not. Again, some of this is, it varies widely. Um, I don't like touching or hugging people that I'm not very close to. Um, you know, I hug my fiance and a few other people, but otherwise it's just like, no, don't touch me. Um, uh, temperature intolerance, which I mentioned earlier, particularly heat um, or cold, depends on the person. Pain sensitivity. So this was, uh, there's another paper that came out recently. I saw it on Neuroscience Daily where it was, it, the, the, the new conclusion is that autistic people are actually more sensitive to pain that we're not actually indifferent to pain, which I don't even know where that myth came from. Um, but there's a myth out there that autistic people are indifferent to pain. And my take is we're just used to pain. Everything hurts every day. <laughs> so we just learn to ignore it and live with it. And actually learning to deminimize pain was really critical um, in my journey of self-acceptance. When I started learning to recognize the muscle tension and pain that I had everywhere in my body, I would literally wake up like in agony and I'd had to go do yoga in order to get the pain out. And now that I have a lower stress lifestyle, I don't have nearly as much pain every day. Um, but your relationship with pain could be very weird uh, if, you, if, you are, um, if you are on the spectrum. Um, there's probably a lot more stuff around sensory processing that I'm forgetting, but uh, obviously there's a lot here. Um, same foods. Uh, so we, ha we, uh, we have same foods and same clothes and we have favorites. We pick favorites of things, right? I have my Dragon Age Inquisition mug that I use like all the time. Um, I use it for tea. I use it for coffee. I try not to use it for juice. It's weird for juice because it's like you, you don't want to drink juice and coffee out of the same thing. Anyways, so we often have very well-developed preferences. Um, some, uh, sometimes these preferences are around foods that just don't make us feel bad. Because we have digestive issues, because our guts are particularly sensitive, we will gravitate towards the foods that don't hurt us. And so, you know, I've seen children that either, that I either knew were on the spectrum or at least had clearly had some autistic traits. And I noticed that they're very picky eaters. And part of the reason is that they don't want to eat is because eating makes them feel bad. It just hurts, right? Again, like our relationship with our bodies and pain is very strange. And I think some of it can be, uh, can definitely be fixed by the, the right dietary choices and the right supplementation. At least again, for me, it really helped. Um, we often enjoy the same games, movies, TV shows, sports, hobbies, whatever. We can be obsessive about some of these things to the point that other people get tired of it. Ask me about the time that I wanted to play Settlers of Catan every day until everyone was like, Dave, we're done with Settlers of Catan. Um, also ask my fiance about how many times I watched Dune. <laughs> um, so, uh, we, we might also cycle through these and we'll talk more about that in, uh, when we talk about special interests in a minute. Um, we develop routines, rituals, and patterns. Basically, we like to come up with rules, and this is because predictability and stability are really important to us. Um, we, we uh, uh, broadly, some of us can handle and improvise, but in general, we don't handle change very well. Even if it's positive change, sometimes it's like, if something is different and new, it can be exciting, but can also be very stressful. Um, you know, moving, getting a new car, getting a new job, um, new relationships, any big life change can be extra stressful for us. And so we prefer uh, stability and it, that can also make us seem controlling. And, uh, you know, when you talk to other uh, autistic people, you'll realize we all are controlling in the same ways and it doesn't bother us. But we often need control that neurotypicals don't understand. And so to them, it seems weird. Um, and this, this is actually a big source of conflict um, uh, between uh, neurotypicals and neurodivergent people. Um, 
but yeah, so like I've got, you know, like my favorite sweater, I've got like favorite blanket, I've got my favorite mug, whatever. So we, we like, we like to pick favorites, um, same foods, same things, that sort of stuff. Ableism and disability. So this is a super controversial topic and I will try and navigate it as, uh, as carefully as I can. Um, but so the, the, the core question is, are we different or are we disabled? And so you might say neurodivergent or neurodiversity, or you might look at it through the disability model. So Devin Price in Unmasking Autism says unequivocally that, that autism and neurodiversity is a disability by sheer virtue of the fact that the world is not meant for us, that we have to adapt to the world and that, and that our needs even no matter how mundane they are, are considered special accommodations, which we often don't get. So from that perspective, any kind of neurodiversity, whether or not you can get by on your own, is a disability. That's Devin's opinion. Um, I think there's some merit to it. I don't fully agree with it. Um, then there's the diversity mindset, which is really we're just different. But if you put us together, like you, know, you have uh, two people with similar kinds of neurodiversity, we usually get along really well, and then any any feeling of disability disappears. Um, so you could look at it from the disability perspective or the diversity perspective. As with all things, there's a lot of nuance and subtlety, and I'm not going to say it's somewhere in the middle because it's something else, right? Now, another way to look at this is from a medical perspective. So the, the DSM-5 defines three levels of support requirements. So there's level one, two, and three. I'm not going to get into the details, but the point is, is that from a, from a uh, medicalization perspective or a public health policy perspective, ASD is a disability. It's just a matter of how severe, right? So again, there's nuance to it. Um, now, uh, from a social perspective, there is often a lot of divisiveness between high needs and low needs people and uh, family members of high needs versus low needs because I am a very low needs person. I am uh, intelligent enough and oriented enough and, and, uh, and capable enough to adapt and support myself and take care of myself and have generally healthy relationships now, that sort of stuff. So that gives me a lot of privilege, which means that I basically have a fundamentally different experience from the friends, families, and sufferers of higher needs, level, uh, level two and level three needs people, their experience of life is fundamentally different from mine. And so that's, this is a big reason that there is a, uh, a divide is because it's like, we're basically in, in entirely different camps. Our, our experiences are fundamentally different, which um, again, like, like I said, I wanna try and navigate this as delicately as I can because it's not so black and white. Um, and I think that I think that this field is going to continue to proliferate and specialize, and more information will become uh, uh, publicly available. Special interests. So, special interests. I already talked about this a couple times. These are obsessions or fixations that you might have. Things that we just love so much. Um, sometimes our special interests are fixed for life. Um, I picked an image of chess because chess is one of the quintessential things that uh, someone might just be a diehard competitive chess player their entire life. Um, sometimes our special interests are transient, which means that they, they might change over time and we master something and then move on and then master the next thing and then move on. Sometimes our special interests are also cyclical. We come back to them over time. So those are the three kinds of orientations um, that we, excuse me, can have towards special interests. Some examples include uh, collections or uh, categories. So like stamp collecting is kind of the, uh, the, the, the tongue in cheek one. Um, but you know, uh, collecting music, collecting movies, uh, collecting anime, comics, um, those kinds of things that we really uh, enjoy, um, collecting parts or toys or whatever. Um, those, are, those are very uh, uh, common kinds of um, special interests. Reading, researching and intellectual pursuits, another very common kind of special interest. Um, so if there's, if like you learn about a new topic and you're like, I'm going to become an expert on Egypt, that is a special interest. Um, for me, my intellectual special interest is artificial intelligence and everything around it, including the philosophy, ethics, and implementation and so on. 
Um, and then another type of special interest are going to be activities, hobbies, games, that sort of stuff. Um, you can have like hiking as a special interest or canoeing as a special interest or rock climbing. I actually knew um, a, a couple, some friends, they moved away, so I don't talk to them anymore. Um, but they were like rock climbing special interest people. They watched documentaries about rock climbing. They talked about rock climbing. They had rock climbing periodicals. They practiced it. And I was just like, wow, you guys do everything about rock climbing. It's you eat, sleep and breathe rock climbing. It's <laughs> so that is, that is another example of like a physical special interest. Special interests are sometimes shunned or punished or discouraged by families or society. Um, and it's in some cases, it's because there's no immediate financial value to a special interest. Like unless you're going to do something competitively and win competitions and make money, you're kind of discouraged from doing it, especially in America, because, you know, it's the pursuit of the almighty dollar comes first. So unless your special interest has to be something that happens to be something that is lucrative also, you're often discouraged or dissuaded from doing it. Um, and so by repeatedly getting having your passions uh, devalued, eventually you give up in exchange to just make money. Um, I am very lucky and grateful that I was able to parlay one of my special interests into a new career. Um, so that's that. Uh, neurotypicals. So you might have heard me use the term neurotypical a few times now. There is a, a shorthand for that. It's called tippies. Um, the, the word tippy is somewhat pejorative. Um, it kind of creates an us versus them mentality uh, because we have been ostracized or, or rejected. And so it's kind of a way of categorically labeling someone else as like, actually, maybe you're the problem. Um, so, but anyways, neurotypicals are people that are closer to the average than us. Um, there is a phenomenal quote that I had from an internet friend like 15 years ago. Um, I can't remember this guy's name, but his mom worked with autistic, uh, I think autistic teens or autistic young adults. And she said, everyone has autistic traits. It's just a matter of how many and how severe. So basically, congratulations, everyone is on the spectrum. It's just a matter of where on the spectrum. <laughs> there are no tippies anymore. Um, no, anyways, in all seriousness, um, it's a matter of like, you know, there's a kind of a threshold, right? Are you neurotypical enough to pass? Um, or do you believe that you're neurotypical? Some people still identify as neurotypical, even though they're not. Um, and then we have another term that's coming up we call the tism, um, which I think is just hilarious. Like, I've got the tism. So anyways, I wanted to bring this up because, uh, again, it is kind of becoming an us versus them thing um, where, you know, it's like, uh, the neurotypicals, typical, typical neurotypical or, you know, typical autistic person or whatever. And so there's, you know, autistic versus the tippies. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to, to point this out. Like it is what it is. I'm not saying if it's good or bad. I'm just making some observations that there is this sort of othering that's happening. And again, like I understand that as a reaction because we have been othered. We have been alienated from our own interests, from our own true natures, and that sucks and it doesn't feel fair. Um, so just be careful with this. Um, and then finally, part five, next steps. Again, this the whole point of this is a crash course giving you a bunch of information about autism if you happen to be on the spectrum or think that you are. So the overview is read a bunch of books if you can. Um, there's not always books or you might not have the ability to read books. That's fine. There's audiobooks if you can do that. Um, watch a ton of videos. There's a slew of videos on YouTube. Uh, connect with others and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then finally make substantive changes in your life. So let's unpack this. First, learn everything you can. If you found this video and you clicked on it, it's probably because you're in the information gathering phase. So there's books that I mentioned a few already. There's YouTube videos, there's Reddit, there's other social media groups. You can find new friends. You probably actually know someone who is on the spectrum or can help you find friends that are on the spectrum. Um, so having, having friends that you can talk to is invaluable. Like someone that can like be your guide, like, ah, oh, welcome to the club. Um, invaluable. Uh, meetup meetup.com can also be really good. Not, not specifically finding autistic groups, but finding special interest groups. So my fiance and I met at our sci-fi writing group. Um, hey, special interest, right? So just so happens that, you know, if you go, if you share special interest with people, you might also share other things with them. 
Um, and it could be neurodiversity. It could just be something else. But anyways, meetup can be a great way to indulge in your special interests and find people who are like you. New friends and new hobbies. Um, so connecting with people who get you is really important. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, until more recently in my life, I hadn't really connected with anyone that I felt like I truly understood and that truly understood me. And 36, well, I guess it was 33, 34, that's a long time to go without having like too many genuine connections. And that being said, I do have a few friends that now that I, now that I have the lens of like, oh, I'm on the spectrum, now I understand our friendship better. So I'm not saying that like I had no friends until I was 33. It's that radical self-acceptance and self-learning really helped me understand how I connect to people and, um, and, and, and how they connect to me and ultimately to uh, deepen those relationships and find new ones. Um, another part of self-learning is letting go of those myths and letting go of bad habits and bad beliefs. Um, so for instance, like, you know, I allow myself to just play with my stim cube as I need to. I'll be sitting on Zoom meetings, like fidgeting with this, like under the desk. And it's like, you don't know that I'm autistic. <laughs> Fooled you. Um, uh, yeah, so getting rid of the shame and the guilt, especially over like one thing that, that I had, and I think I've watched a videos talking about this, where there's often a lot of shame or guilt over meltdowns. Because it's like, why did I have this behavior where normally I am a mature, like competent adult and then I had a temper tantrum? Like, I'm not like that. I'm not a kid. But then it's like, oh, I'm autistic and I was super overwhelmed and I was not being treated fairly. So I had a meltdown. Oh, that's not really my fault. I'm doing the best that I can. Um, and then you just distance yourself from people like that. Um, sometimes you have to let relationships go. So this is one of those, this is one of the more uh, substantive changes that I mentioned, um, and also banishing toxic people from your life. I am a big fan of blocking people. Like if I realize that someone does not have my best interests in mind, or that someone is trying to exploit me in any way, block. I block them on LinkedIn. I block them on Twitter. I block them on YouTube. Um, and it's just like, that is a self-protective measure. And it's like, you give me the bad vibes. I, I learned to trust my gut instinct. And I also first learned to develop a gut instinct because one problem as an autistic person is I didn't have gut instinct about people, um, which is another reason that we like can be super vulnerable. Um, and then finally, like revisit the stuff about yourself that you suppressed, right? Like learn who you really are, what you really care about and, and do that stuff. So like for the longest time, I just thought that AI was just going to be like the special interest that I had on the side. But then I was like, you know what? I'm done pretending. Like, this is something I really care about. I'm going to do this. Um, and then same with sci-fi. I'm writing a novel. I don't know if I'll ever make any money on it, but I really care about it and I enjoy doing it. Other life changes. So I, I, I want to, uh, I've had a lot of caveats in this video. I want to had a caveat that these are not recommendations. I'm not telling you what to do. These are just possible options. Some stuff that that I have done and that other people have done that helped them. So one, changing or quitting jobs. Um, I recently quit my day job. I will never go back to an office job or a corporate job. Um, I say that as someone who's starting a startup, but I'm like, I'm like the absentee CEO, right? Like I, I'm the man behind the curtains. I just run stuff from the shadows, you know, via email, via Slack, via Zoom meetings. Like that's how I run things and that works for me. Um, remote work, excellent. Flexible hours, excellent. That's how you do things. Um, many autistic people end up unemployed. So on a more serious note, uh, this comes from uh, Devin Price's book, um, Unmasking Autism. Many autistic people end up unemployed because we cannot handle ordinary jobs. If it was not for the pandemic, I would have been in that category. The pandemic was the only thing that saved my career. And that was because I finally had the protected space to take a nap if I needed to, to read a book if I needed to, to disconnect from work and get out of the office. Um, so for anyone who says, we need to get back to the office, like keep in mind that some people actually need the work from home. Um, change relationships, I mentioned this already. Um, end toxic relationships and find healthier people, whether it's romantic relationships, friendships, or others, right? Like protect yourself at all costs. 
I'm giving you permission to banish people that are bad for you. Um, let go of shoulds. Let go of patterns that don't fit. Um, change your laundry, sleeping, and eating habits as needed. Um, all of my clothes are in like little basic drawers now. And I also keep most of my clothes in the dirty laundry basket. So it's like, like I, I, I empty the dirty laundry basket. It's a nice clean plastic basket. I wash the clothes. And then usually my clean clothes stay in that basket until eventually I get around to putting them away. Um, but they're clean. Um, <laughs> and so Devin Price calls this building an autistic life for yourself. Definitely recommend that. It takes a while. It's taken me about a year to get to where I'm at now um, of just making little changes here and there around what I eat, when I eat, how I do chores, how I do errands. For me, the list, the checklist is perfect because um, there is nothing quite so satisfying as one, having a system and two, crossing things off the list. Definitely recommend. Also, if you want a book on checklist, Checklist Manifesto, perfect book. Okay, anyways, finally, dress and act in a way that's natural to yourself. Unmask if you can. This is a very controversial topic. Not everyone has the privilege to unmask. Um, I have some demographics about me that give me a little bit more privilege. Um, and I also have skills and expertise that basically if I'm a, if you're a dude in tech, it's kind of expected that you're autistic. Um, and so it's a little bit more tolerated that you're going to be quirky or weird. So that's what I mean by like demographics and like, and privilege that allows me to unmask. And since I'm an expert in AI, it's like, oh, well, we just expect you to be weird. Like, you know, I'm the next Nikola Tesla or whatever. Um, but if you can, be as weird as you want. Dress differently, pick up those different hobbies, be weird in public, just don't hurt anybody, right? Um, and making these life changes, especially changes in, in the privacy of your own home, um, that is like, that is quintessential for building an autistic life for yourself. Okay, we're almost at the end. So for a quick recap, Autism has recently progressed a lot. We're going through a renaissance. Just in the last couple of years, there's a lot of great new information out there. We still have a long ways to go because calling it the autism spectrum disorder, implying that it's a single spectrum, no, it's like 20 different dimensions. There are so many kinds of neurodiversity that like it, cannot, it can't be thrown into a single category, but that's all we got right now. Autism is still very deeply misunderstood, um, whether it's myths that persist out there, stigma against it. Um, uh, stigma against autism is a big reason that a lot of people who could benefit from this information still reject it. They're like, I don't want to associate with that. I'm going to keep pretending like I'm neurotypical. I will say for myself, letting go of the illusion that I was neurotypical, best life choice so far. I'm still getting used to it. And that's why I finally, after a year, made this video. Many controversies abound. Namely, uh, the disability conversation. That is probably the biggest controversy um, around autism, uh, followed closely by ABA therapy and other, um, other uh, attitudes towards it. Like, does autism need to be cured or not? That is another hot button issue. Um, I didn't even mention that earlier. Um, there's a, there's a, a school of thought that autism needs to be cured, and there's a school of thought that autism doesn't need to be cured, that it should, should be allowed to exist. I honestly don't know. There are some days that I wish that I could take a pill and just be neurotypical. There are other days that I'm like, you know what? I'm doing all right. Um, so again, it's currently undergoing a renaissance. A lot of these problems will be discussed and I don't know if they'll be solved, but at least we'll have more information soon. There's tons of resources all over. So thanks for watching and I really hope this helped. Like I said, the point of this video was this is the video I wish I had a year ago. So help, hope, hope it helped. Thanks for watching.